All right, I'm here with my new buddy, Ghost. Ghost has a little bit of jelly in her role, so she needs to work on a little bit of diet. Um, we talked about feeding. That's actually one of the things we went over. This is her roadmap to success. Um, we'll start off with talking about feeding. A lot of us, we have rescue dogs, which she's through Wags and Walks, which is a great organization. If you're in LA and you're looking to adopt a dog, I would highly recommend them. They're a great organization. Uh, but basically, when we have rescue dogs, we often feel sorry for what happened to them before, and we try to remove all rules and structure as some way for us as humans, we think that's a positive for dogs. For dogs, um, eating is the most important activity they participate in. And when they eat, they eat in the order of their rank. You're going to go away? All right. <laughs> um, and uh, so if we eat, uh, don't eat before the dog, that can confuse the dog into thinking that it has more rank or authority than we do. Also, if there's food in the bowl all the time, we call that free feeding, there's not really much impetus to eat it. If you're on a diet, man, every food that you can't have, you're just thinking about that really passionately. When you're off your diet, you can eat pizza every Friday. You're like, whatever. It's not as passion. It's not as um, important. So for the dog, uh, I put food in the bowl. I would eat something first and not let the dog eat. When I and all it has to be is five bites. If you can get a chip or a cracker or something, preferably crunchy. And then when I get done, I invite the dog to come over to eat, and I would come up with a command word that means to eat. So you can say whatever the word is that you want, a favorite restaurant, name of a type of food. I say grub chow feast and eat, whatever your word you want. But again, try to think of a funny word. So if you say something uh, that's, you know, that's a restaurant that you like, it kind of resonates. Um, okay, so that's eating. That's an important one. Um, the guardians also, um, I'll go in the order of importance. I noticed the guardians were, in t uh, were petting a ghost every time she was insecure. And that's a very normal thing, especially when we're parents, because we have a little kid, we want to rock our kid and teach her, no, you're fine. Um, this is, life happens. Um, and so uh, we just got to roll with it. But um, if, if a dog is, is nervous and we pet the dog, anything our dog's doing when we pet it is what we're amplifying. Nervous, anxiety, frustration, even excitement. Most of us confuse excited for happy when it comes to dogs. A dog can be excited and calm. It can be excited and happy. They frequently are. But excited is an unbalanced state of mind that we're not going to be thinking our most clearly when we're out of balance. So when we come home, if Ghost is all excited, ignore Ghost. Don't tell her to jump or to sit or do anything. Just ignore her. And as soon as she kind of settles down, start reaching for her. As soon as you reach for her, she's going to start wiggling it. Pull your arm back and continue doing your thing. Don't say no. You're saying through your actions, when, you're in, when you get out of balance, I lose interest in engaging with you. When you're calm and balanced, then you're very attracted to me and I want to pet and engage with you. And after enough starting and stopping, the dog will start to emulate the behaviors that you want. Now, I mentioned the guardian. Most of us, when it comes to dogs, we focus on only half of the equation. Mm -hmm. When the dog sits, we, like there, we pet it and say sit, or we give it a treat and say sit. That's great. That's a positive reinforcement. However, negative re or negative punishment is what we call it, is to deduct something from the equation. So if I'm petting Ghost and then Ghost puts her paw on me, that can be a dominance move. If I continue petting her, I'm saying I agree with that move. But if I'm petting her, as soon as she does that, I stop petting her. Ooh. That had the unintended consequence of stopping what I'm enjoying. I meant to say keep on doing that. So dogs went through repetition, consistency, and good timing. You have three seconds to correct or reward the dog for them. They have the ability to make that connection, and it has to be repeated over and over consistently enough times before they get the message. So um, for the dog, if we get in a habit of as soon as it puts its paw up or barks or does whatever we don't want, we stop immediately after enough repetition, the dog will figure that out. Now, I also asked the guardians, because we have a dog with separation anxiety, what rules does the dog have? And the guardian gave me a pause and then was not able to come up with any rules. Um, and this is a pretty common, uh, uh, ref common response from all my clients. When we have a dog with separation anxiety, it's really an insecurity, as I talked about in the video above. And if the dog thinks I can tell the humans what to do or I have the same authority as the humans, then I am somewhat responsible for them. So uh, lack of rules confuses the dog into thinking we're peers, and if we're peers, then listening to you is optional. But also, if I tell you what to do and you do it, now I feel like I'm res responsible for you as humans. So when I nudge you, you say, okay, you pet me. And so now when you, when you try to leave the house, I say, no, don't leave. Some border collie might take advantage of you. All right, take me with you. I'll be there to protect you. And we leave the dog behind, the dog panics. And a lot of dogs, it's just being alone with anyone. Some dogs they have to be one, one specific person. In this case, she just needs to be with anyone. And so the guardians take her to doggy daycare, which is wonderful. But the video above talks about the triggers and the things we can do to help her get over this particular problem. Uh, I could pet her to say up for that if I wanted that to be a command. I probably don't need that as a command <laughs> word, but that's a good example of passive training. Um, so uh, the more down, 
So we're using yes. Mm -hmm. I like using fun command words. Try to come up with for future command words, fun command words, especially because we have a little one. Mm -hmm. And uh, with, uh, with little P, we'll call her, is <laughs> running around and her friends come over. If we tell the dog Capone or, and the dog rolls over and plays dead, that's funny. That makes people laugh. If we say sushi and the dog goes and eats its food, that's mm -hmm. funny. That makes us laugh. We call the dog bed, what do we call the dog bed? Cape. Cape. For Cape Cod. And so every time the dog goes to the dog bed, we call it Cape. And so now if we have friends that know that maybe the couple met on Cape Cod or something special happened there, and they're like, oh, you that was your story, and that's mm -hmm. so cute. And again, the dog can read your facial expressions, and that dog is motivated to want to go there mm -hmm. or to lay down or whatever do these things are. Um, let me see. We also went over uh, the importance of rules and structure. Uh, now, for dogs that, are, uh, that have separation anxiety, we want them to clearly identify as being in a following position. But if we let the dog tell us what to do and we do it, that confuses them to think they're in the leadership position. So instead, what I like to do, she's burying her nose, um, is if she uh, nudges uh, or, uh, the, uh, well, for dogs, they're all about what they see us do. From a from dog's perspective, we seem pretty lazy if we don't have any rules. We're not consistent. We think of rules of human psychology as something that's negative and breaking a rule or overcoming a rule as a positive. For dogs, they go through life probing, waiting. They're probing to see how far they can go. They're waiting for you to tell them no. And if they have no rules, then you're not consistent. You don't have any good timing. And there's not repeating anything on a regularity. So it's hard for the dog to understand and learn this is how far the limit is. So I went over some rules such as not being allowed in the furniture, which we'll be enforcing after this, mm -hmm. and using those X mats um, mm -hmm. when you're not here. Um, uh, let me see, for the bed, the guardians really like sleeping with the dog, so the dog should only be allowed in the bed with an invitation. Mm -hmm. And only, these are privileges, and these are only available for good behavior. So if she gets on the bed and she decides, I wanna sit right next to you and fart in your face, well then you gotta get down, there's a whole lot of floor for you. If you mm -hmm. wanna share our bed, it's with our rules. Um, and so for me, I make my dog sit, sleep in a certain part of the bed because mm -hmm. I'm a leg thrasher and I got two Dalmatians that want to sleep on either side of me and I'm wedged in and discern mm -hmm. time, it's too hot. Mm -hmm. So you're on that side, you're on that side, I have the rest of the bed to thrash around. And if they don't like it, like I said, they can go down. Um, so uh, no furniture for 30 days minimum to get those neural pathways to align, um, but it might be longer than that. And also mm -hmm. remember to get those uh, uh, de-shedding gloves. They're about mm -hmm. 10 bucks on Amazon. They'll be black with like an orange or blue around it. 10 bucks, if you can't find them, message me and I'll show you how to get them. Um, okay, uh, so uh, that would be one rule. There's also um, a little carpet area here and uh, the guardians sometimes eat here. When we're eating, the dog should not be within seven feet of us. California real estate's a little bit more expensive than Nebraska so basically there's a little rug here I'd say when the humans are eating here she's not allowed to be on the rug the rest of the time she can go and go as she pleases but not when we're eating kitchen there is kind of a, 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 a straight shaped kitchen like this but it's a little diagonal because the refrigerator's on the end so I would tape from the edge of the refrigerator to the edge of the counter and that zone is off limits to the dog when we're preparing food <laughs> Now, to help the dog practice not coming on here or not going there, we want to do a couple things. We want to set the dog up for success by teaching the dog to leave the area. So the way that I would do that is to, for this area rug, when the dog's on the floor, I would touch the nose with a treat, and I'd throw the, uh, the treat right outside, about three feet outside of the area. When the dog goes and licks it up, I would say the word out. Remember, anytime you use a treat, the dog should hear the command word after it goes in the mouth. Mm -hmm. um, the dog comes back, and I do it a second time. And I do that maybe uh, a couple times a day with, you know, uh, maybe three or four times a day with about three or four treats for this area. Eventually you say out and the dog runs over there gleefully expecting to get the treat. Once she's make that transition, once she leaves with just the command, then go over there and give her a treat and say the word out as well. Mm -hmm. First we do it to entice, then we do it to reward. Mm -hmm. um, and once we have established that, we do the same thing for the kitchen. Go into the kitchen and throw the treat beyond the line and say the word out. Now, if you want to be really specific, you can name each room in the house, throw a treat in the kitchen and say the word kitchen when she licks it up. Living room, bedroom, or you know, den, or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. I don't think in this case that's really necessary, but something you can do. Um, and that way, when we, and if we don't, the dog doesn't, then we're gonna use those three escalating consequences. As the dog's approaching it, we're gonna make the hissing sound. Once they break the boundary, stand up and turn to face the dog, keep it in front of us. Pivot at your waist until the dog stops moving, then take two steps backwards and pause for one second, then go back to doing what you're doing. But if you sat, what you were doing was sitting, sitting down, don't sit deeply into the couch like this, sit on the edge of the couch, because you want to be able to bounce back up right away. You should expect the dog to challenge you a second time. Um, and keep on doing that until the dog sits or lies down outside the boundary. 
The third thing we do is we march deliberately at the dog until it turns sideways or greater away from us. <laughs> um, and then at that point we stop in place, we put our, uh, and then we basically go to the second consequence, pivoting as long as the dog's moving, it's stationary, two steps backwards and pause one second. And when we're doing it, like uh, if you're doing, trying to keep the dog out of the kitchen or out of this area, let's say that this is the boundary and I march up towards the dog using a third consequence, the dog stops, I take two steps backwards and I pause for a second. If the dog comes forward, I march back again as my wife's saying no. So you're gonna do back and forth, back and forth and pause for a quarter second at the end of each one of these movements until eventually the dog sits or lies down. Now if, I, if this is where the dog is and this is the boundary right here and I turn and I walk this way, now my authority is pointing this way. So at first you wanna walk backwards. Take a left foot, right foot and pause. <laughs> left foot, right foot and pause. And that staggered movement tells the dog, I'm not, I love where she's at. Yeah. Uh, she's on her new dog bed, we'll talk about in a sec. Uh, but basically, uh, that lets the dog know we're not just meandering around, we're communicating. Uh, now, whenever we take away the furniture, I like to train the dog to use a dog bed. So we pull out the dog bed out of the kennel because she doesn't really use it. And I tossed a treat on there. When she went on there and looked it up, we said, that's when we said cod, because cape, or we said cape or cod? Cape. Cape, excuse me. Cape cod would be two words, not yeah. like one word commands. And so then we tossed about 10 treats. Every time she went over and looked it up, we said cape. And then after a while, we stopped, and then she went over there on her own, and then I threw the treat afterwards. She just, she just laid down on it. Awesome. Um, but this way, if we take this away, we give the dog an opportunity to do this. In her case, it's even more important than other dogs because we need her to practice being apart from us. Mm -hmm. And that helps her practice being just a couple feet away, but that's part of what we need her to do for the separation anxiety problem that she has. Uh, let me see, what other rules do we go over? Um, the humans need to eat first, I think I mentioned that. Um, <laughs> Uh, well, for the walk, she's excited when you pull out the leash or not excited? She's excited initially, and then she kind of runs away when you okay. try and... So I think part of that is a little bit of insecurity about the walk. So one of the guardians might want to do is walk her. I know it's not convenient, but, and, and this isn't forever, but maybe walk, you know, drive her to that nice neighborhood that's, this is not a bad neighborhood either, but uh, to the more residential neighborhood. Because mm -hmm. um, right now we're off Santa Monica, it's just too busy. Mm -hmm. um, and so basically once she kind of figures out and she gets more comfortable with it, then we can kind of give her more advanced situations. A lot of people put their dog in a more uh, too advanced a situation. They're not prepared for it, they're not practiced for it, and then they fold and then they don't want to do it again. And we get frustrated because they didn't do well. It's just a cascading effect. Mm -hmm. She's very good attention there. Um, we also showed her a couple exercises. I showed the guardian how to do uh, stay in the video above, but I also showed a focus exercise. If you can't remember how to do all the details of focus exercise, please message me. I have probably a hundred videos of showing that people how to do it. I'm happy to share those with you. For the focus, make sure it's one second, one second, mm -hmm. and uh, get up to that uh, 15 seconds within seven days. Mm -hmm. And both guardians, or all three, should be practicing this in different parts of the house. Mm -hmm. And then you do it, and then go back uh, to the uh, deck and do it for one second, one second. Mm -hmm. We can move a little bit faster, then eventually do it on walks. So when there's nobody around, and you say, focus, she looks up at you as you're walking, hold up your nose, and pop your mouth and say, focus. Just it's a great way to redirect her attention. Um, also, since she's a smart dog, uh, dogs with separation anxiety typically have uh, a little bit of insecurity and a great way to build, deal with that is to teach her some new tricks or commands. Mm -hmm. So if you go to YouTube, all these trainers wanna be like Caesar Milan, they want a TV show. So they'll show you how to do all these tricks, it's mm -hmm. totally free. So what I'd like to see the guardians do is practicing. Now the guardians here have very important jobs and they work really hard. But if it's it's very cathartic sometimes. It's a very good way to release stress for yourself to mm -hmm. work with the dog. And so maybe one week, we uh, Guardian A teaches how to, st how to uh, roll over. And then next week, Guardian B teaches a bang your dead. And each one, if, if each Guardian teaches five tricks, at the end of a month and a half, that's 10 new ways of redirecting the dog's attention. Mm -hmm. And also 10 ways of boosting the dog's self-esteem. Uh, for the dog, uh, for the bed, because the guardians like sleeping on the dog bed, like I said, make sure it's with an invitation only. Mm -hmm. um, let me see what else. Um, uh, we talked about uh, getting uh, things for her to chew on. Mm -hmm. When dogs uh, get stressed out, they chew. And so she should have some antlers. I gave her a bully stick. She loved a bully mm -hmm. stick. Make sure you go to The Natural Dog Company and get the odor-free bully sticks. For her, I'd actually recommend the bully bites, okay. which are gonna be little smaller pieces, which are more appropriate for her. She shouldn't get more than one a day. Mm -hmm. But again, having her over there, and mm -hmm. I talked a little bit about possibly getting one of those baby, uh, not a baby gate, but a puppy playpen. Mm -hmm. They're eight 24 inch panels of various, whatever height you order from. If you set that up over in the corner, put her in there with a bully stick and then sit here and watch TV. You're not practicing to stay, but she is practicing staying away from you mm -hmm. and being calm while you're in the same room. 
Um, let me see. Also went over a counter conditioning exercise. Come here, ghost. How about up here? Can you come up here and get this? Now, only ask the dog to do things once and then make the dog do it on her own. There we go. So I'm providing her with a, reinfor or a motivation to want to get up here, but I'm not asking her to do it up. So I just provided a situation. So um, a couple of things. Because she likes to, uh, can you do me a knock for, uh, over there? Oh, sure. So she's going to get a mouth. She's, you see she stopped, bark, bark, mm -hmm. uh, stopped to chew it. So every once in a while, like the guardians when they're in the other room, just to knock a couple times and simulate the knock at the door without it being the actual knock at the door. Mm -hmm. And after a while, nobody comes to the door, the humans are at the door, I'm just gonna stop barking. So she here, she's a little confused what's going on, but she didn't do the barking. Now, one other thing that she does is she barks like crazy when the doorbell rings. Now, I try to do one of the more advanced, sneaky things I do and it kind of backfired a little bit. So what you wanna do is you wanna deliver the reinforcer, which are these. Mm -hmm. um, now, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll take one, here, ghost. Another one, there you go, is I'll take it and I'll smash it so that I can get her to look at it. I do this a lot of times with dogs that are afraid of skateboards. Sit. Notice I'm keeping the treat with an inch of her nose, trying to rock her back into a sit. So I take the treat, I smash it, that was a nice jewel, and then I let her nibble on it and I can change whatever direction she looks by just moving the treat. So the idea is now, while she's having this delivered, I would say on my cell phone to the person outside the door, now or a color or a number, and they would ring the doorbell. Now, first, when that happens, she's probably going to stop and run over to the doorbell. You don't say a word. We just wait. Yes, I know. I'm going to tell them that you get a lot of treats. Um, and then we wait for her to completely settle down. Then we pull out another one and repeat this process. This is classical conditioning. After a while, she'll start to associate the doorbell. The doorbell rings, she'll probably start drooling. But that's fine, because that's more desirable than waking up the baby. <laughs> now, the guardians also, like I mentioned earlier, were petting the dog at the wrong time when she was nervous. And so to help the dog guardians get over this, and I can't pet you when you're on top of me unless I invite you up. There we go. So what I'd like the guardians to do is start practicing my petting with a purpose philosophy, which is basically means that we're going to stop petting the dog completely. People always like get mad at me when I hear them say that. That's why I say it this way. Um, but I uh, want to provoke response. And uh, so if the, dog, if the dog nudges and tells me what to do, nothing happens. Instead, I tell the dog to sit or to come or to lay down or do something to change its state. Once it does, I prefer to pet a dog under its chin because a proud dog has his nose in the air and we want her to feel good about herself. And I'm gonna say the word sit, only the word sit, not good sit, just sit. She's already sitting, ask her to come and sit over here or ask her to lay down. She has to do something to change her state. After a while, what will happen is she'll come sit in front of you to prepay for some attention. But even if you wanna pet the dog, still ask the dog to sit and use the watchword of paycheck. Mm -hmm. So if our astronaut husband comes in and sees us petting the dog and the dog is standing and uh, the husband says, paycheck, I would stop petting tell the dog to sit or lie down, pet on the chin, say sit and say, actually, Mr. Uh, I can't say, uh, but our, uh, this is a little inside joke, but I tell the astronaut, hey, actually, I actually asked the dog to sit before you came in the room, you just didn't see it. Uh, but we won't realize how often we pet without a purpose or we're petting to reinforce the wrong things. Uh, now I also go over what I call passive training. Passive training is just waiting for the dog to do something organic, voluntarily on its own without any influence. So every time she comes to us, the, I'd like the guardians to put her and say either come or here. Right now they're using touch as a way of calling the dog, which should be the alternate fun way of calling the dog when the come doesn't work. So pick either come or here, and every time she comes to you, pet her and just say come. Mm -hmm. You're not asking her to do it, but the end result is still what you want, and she still gets the reward. After a while, she'll be happy to come because that's a great way to get attention. Also, the only way she gets petted is by sitting or laying down. So she's mm -hmm. going to start offering those behaviors more often. And so... Uh, like I said, pet with a purpose as much as you possibly can. And if you get in the habit of doing it, every time you pet your dog, it becomes a micro training session that will build her respect for you as an authority figure and help lessen her anxiety. Also, uh, passive training is waiting for the dog to voluntarily offer the behavior and just rewarding it and saying just the command word. Now, the focus exercise, I'd like the guardians to practice that as well because I think she has a lot of cortisol in her blood and that's a stress hormone. And it's related to all the, a lot of these problems that she has. But when a dog is doing certain things and uh, serotonin and oxytocin is being released into their, into their system, the production of cortisol is stopped. And so we can really have positive benefits and the focus helps also helps them focus as well. <laughs> so like I said, if you can't remember how to do it, message me, I'm happy to share that with you. So if she does that, you can say, you know, and she does a cute little 
swimming thing when she's <laughs> trying to sit. So give her a treat and say grovel or mm -hmm. whatever you want to say as the command word for it. If she does this, you can say snuggles. Every time she kisses, you say kisses. Mm -hmm. So passive training is a great way to train. It's an easy way to train your dog. It's a slower way of training your dog. It'll, mm -hmm. it'll take longer. So every time she takes a bite of food, you say sushi. Mm -hmm. After a while, sushi, she knows that means I get to eat my food. Um, let me see. What else? Is there anything else we want to go over? I cover uh, a lot in three hours. Yeah. I think we did everything. Okay, so now if, if there is something else, well, she also has a problem with uh, the walks, but we wanna focus on this right now. So in about a month, you should pretty much be have a good handle on this. Mm -hmm. If you have questions on the separation anxiety video, please message me. If mm -hmm. you need a separate a video on teaching a dog to focus or leave it exercise or touch or anything else, let me know, I can share those with you privately. Um, but if I don't hear from you, I assume that means everything's going great. So, um, let me see. What I'll do, uh, well, we're going to, I guess, summarize this. Ghost, do you have any more questions? Oh, chewables. Mm -hmm. I almost forgot about your favorite thing. We talked about bully sticks a little bit. So, the natural dog company. But also look for getting tracheas, chicken feet, duck mm -hmm. feet, and turkey feet, ducks' heads. Um, tr uh, uh, ch uh, cow's uh, cheeks are better than rawhides, much better than rawhides. Um, and having some of these stuffed in the corner when you have a guest come over, if she gets one of these, or if we set up that puppy playpen, mm -hmm. once a night she gets to go over there while you guys are watching TV or snuggling or whatever, and she practices being over there, getting a really high value item that she likes. Mm -hmm. Also get her an antler, um, a couple of nylo bones that mm -hmm. she's rigid and different, they come in chicken and bacon, different mm -hmm. flavors. The chicken one tastes like everything though. <laughs> but barbecue chicken and different shapes. Everybody gets the one that looks like a skeleton bone that yeah. actually looks like no real bone. You can get one that looks like a forearm. I have one that looks like a Tyrannosaurus, one that's a Y, one that's a donut-like shape. Mm -hmm. And so now they have different ways of doing it. Um, and something else you might want to consider, I think I mentioned, uh, did I to mention the treat, Omega Treat Ball? No. Okay, so um, when dogs are in the wild, they spend 90% of the time looking for food. It's the primal drive of their society. So if we just put food in a bowl, you can come over here and get it. Come on. Um, then, and also play hard to get. Ask her to come to you rather than the other way around. Mm -hmm. So basically what we want to do is, um, yeah, you can get it, um, is I fed my dog out of this for a couple months. Mm -hmm. If the dog has to earn its food, that makes it a boost of self-esteem, which would be mm -hmm. really beneficial for her. It makes this thing called an Omega Treat Ball. Mm -hmm. And it's different size. I would get her one about the size of maybe a, a baseball, mm -hmm. uh, maybe a softball size. And basically, I put the kibble in there, mm -hmm. and then the dog has to nudge it just right to get a couple pieces of kibble to fall out, and they lick it up, oh, yeah. then they nudge it a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So if you set up that ba the play area, mm -hmm. that way the dog can't, it doesn't flat underneath the couch or something mm -hmm. like that. It slows down the eating, down, um, and it makes her feel better because she earned her food. Mm -hmm. And so that'd be a good one that would help as well. Mm -hmm. um, besides that, yeah, uh, her exercise probably could be a little bit up, but I think her exercise is pretty good. She's really a good dog, uh, the separation anxiety, um, and now the guardians know all the triggers and the ways to stop it. Uh, now, if you have questions or things stop working, please message or text me. It's faster to text me, but it's very normal to make me to make adjustments after the session. Okay. All right, Ghost, sit. This is Ghost, who are friends over at uh, Wags and Locks. And this is Ghost Roadmap to Success. Remember, everything you do trains your dog. Only sometimes you mean it.